Crimson Trace offers a free batteries for life program that includes nearly all laser sights, electronic sights, and rifle scopes. Just register your product for a free set of batteries each year at crimsontrace.com. Today on Tom Gresham's Gun Talk, ways to improve your shotgun skill set. A pro-gun Democrat's bid for the U.S. Senate in Montana. Simple gunsmithing tips and more. And as always, call us at 866-TALK-GUN with your comments, questions, and range reports. And now, here's Tom. Well, 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 well. Hey, welcome. Tom Gresham here. It's Gun Talk. We're going to be talking about, well, getting ready for hunting season. Talk about some gunsmithing. We have... uh, an idea on how you can become a better wing shot very quickly, break some more clays, maybe bring down a few more birds during hunting season. And of course, no surprise, we're in the middle of politics as it relates to guns. And we like to talk about the technical, but you sometimes have to talk about the political as well. And we'll certainly be doing that pretty much throughout the show. Um, it was actually a surprise Recently, when we were approached by the Brady Group, formerly known as the Brady Campaign, of course, Jim and Sarah Brady, formerly before that known as Handgun Control Incorporated, uh, being somewhat aligned with the coalition to ban handguns. And they said they'd like to have somebody on the show. I said, well, sure, we've always said we would do that. The last time we were contacted by them, honestly, was, uh, gosh, 15 years ago, something like that. What was interesting was that they said, would you like to have Sarah Brady on? I said, sure. But we weren't contacted by the Brady campaign. We were actually, weirdly enough, contacted by the White House. Yeah, the Bill Clinton White House was actually booking Sarah Brady's media appearances. She ended up being a no-show. But I'm very glad that we're going to have someone on right now. Uh, Kylie Ann Hunter is a Marine veteran, a uh, combat helicopter pilot, with multiple tours. Kylie Ann, thank you for being here. Well, we really appreciate your service. Thank you so much, and I'm, I'm really excited to talk to you all today. Well, excellent. So first of all, tell us a little bit about your military background, if you would, please. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, I was a Marine Corps Cobra pilot. I flew so Cobra attack helicopters in Iraq and Afghanistan, and then I finished up my time in the Marine Corps as the legislative liaison officer to the House of Representatives. So I think sometimes I probably needed more combat pay for being in Congress than in <laughs> combat. But true, true. <laughs> it's uh, it, it is a mess, but it, it does teach you uh, to maybe I don't know what it, what does it teach you actually well, is the question. It is so. I mean, one one of the most important things it teaches you is actually to have civil engagement and yes. to be able to disagree without being disagreeable. And also, I think one of the most important things is, I didn't know it at the time, but our, our namesake, Jim Brady, um, you know, who was Reagan's press secretary who was right. shot, you know, his, uh, his big motto was shaking hands, not fist. And so uh. that's, that's, you know, it taught me when I was there as a legislative liaison officer. And now hopefully with, uh, I, have, I know I have a very unique background, being at Brady right now, you mm-hmm. know, I grew up shooting skeet competitively. Uh, I still shoot competitively and love to hunt. And um, I'm a I'm a combat veteran and I'm working for a gun violence prevention organization. And so I'm I'm really excited that you're you're having me on today to be able to talk about how we can shake hands, not fists, over what is too frequently a a sure. overly contentious topic. Well, obviously, uh, the Brady campaign, now known as Brady, has been at this a long time, uh, advocating uh, basic controlling or banning handguns at one point. We're now at a weird place in that over the last 20 years, uh, murders are down by 50 percent and crimes with guns are down by 70 percent, according to the FBI. What's the role of Brady, given this enormous and very, very uh, good you know, results we have of reducing murders and reducing gun crimes so much? Yeah, so I think one of the biggest things is important to look at is you know, we are no longer handgun controlling and we're not looking at banning guns. Our big focus is to reduce gun violence. And uh, the target we've set for ourselves is reducing gun violence by 25% by 2025. Because I know as a, as a gun owner, I don't like gun violence. I don't think anybody likes gun violence. And so our big push is to take a comprehensive public health approach to gun violence. You know, gun violence kills 100 people a day, and that includes suicides, homicides, 
unintentional shootings. And those are things none of us like. Yeah, no, yeah so I, I would agree with you. Other than justifiable homicides, if you're in self-defense or police yeah. officers doing it, right. I would agree that no, no responsible gun owner wants right. any of this. So the question then becomes... What do we do? What, what, right? what do you do? What, what you, you know, obviously, and, we have a bunch of us on the gun side who are working with suicide prevention groups now, understanding that that's where two thirds of the yep. gun deaths are, yeah. are, are, you know, because we're we're the contact point. We, the gun industry, the gun yep. people, we're the contact point with people with guns. And so now we're, but we don't really understand. We don't know suicide prevention. So we have several groups now that are working with the suicide prevention groups. Where's Brady? And. Yeah, and we um, we are as well. And I think one of the biggest things is we have a campaign called End Family Fire that we launched almost exactly a year ago. We launched it on August 8th, 2018. And the purpose of it is a gun owner to gun owner conversation about having open and honest conversations about the risks that guns may pose in your home. We know that guns by their can be risky when they have them. And there are certain situations in which they're more risky than others. We started this campaign focusing on unintentional shootings of children, focusing on the fact that every day eight children are, are shot by guns that they find in the home, you know, child to child, either unintentionally shooting themselves or another kid. So we focus on how to have honest, open conversations among gun owners as how to rit- mitigate those risks. One way is safe storage and how those safe storage needs change as your, your family needs change. And we're now morphing this campaign into talking about suicide. And we're working very closely with uh, national suicide prevention organizations, mm-hmm. the American Association of Suicidology, really with the focus of how to arm mental health per, um, professionals with the tools to talk to their patients who may be in crisis about the risks of firearms. I mean, as all a, that, all that sounds veteran. good. Yeah, that all sounds mm-hmm. good. But are, are you also advocating for laws requiring how you uh, have to store your gun? In, in some instances, and they're more around child access protection laws, because one of the things we know from the, the research is that no matter what you tell children to do, children are going to do the opposite. You know, in fact, a recent government accountability office report showed that any program directed directly at kids is likely to be unsuccessful because despite the fact that kids will repeat back to adults, I won't touch guns, I won't play with guns, at least 20% still go and play with guns when their parents aren't around and then tell their parents they didn't. The obvious question for most gun owners is, the the obvious question we have is, okay, if you're going to require some type of safe safe gun storage, how does that gel with having a gun available for self-defense? How how do you... There's got to be and so one, a way one to of do the that. Other things, yep, one of the other things that we're working on is how to incentivize technologies, particularly around you know, biometric safe, safe storage technologies, make them affordable, make them readily available so that you, know, you can have that six seconds availability of a, a fingerprint safe that's sitting right by your bed if you need it there, but that your six-year-old can't find. Does, that, so apply to, does, that, go, does that go all the way to smart guns? We're, we're, our big focus is we want to incentivize the, the research to make them available and affordable. Essentially, treat gun violence and shootings like other public health issues where we're incentivizing the market to make safer, more affordable solutions that keep children safe. That also, these uh, same technologies are going to help law enforcement. Well, no, actually, no, uh, not at all. Uh, I mean, Here's my deal. If smart guns are a really good idea, let's require all law enforcement agencies to use them for two years as the test protocol because they say, well, well, gee, we have to trust our lives on them. And I say, well, of course, you know what? We have to trust our lives on them. For me, a self-defense gun is a parachute. And anybody who's had trouble getting their phone to unlock, I don't think we really want to be having to biometric unlock a parachute on the way down. That's what a self-defense gun is to me. And that's why our, our big focus is let's incentivize research in how to make this effective and better. Like right now, the way the, the restrictions are, there hasn't been investment on incentivizing the industry to come up with safer, more effective and efficient solutions. And so that's you, one of our big pushes is do, on do you, do you how, guys do we, at least, how do, do we push? Do you at least acknowledge what the National Safety Council says, which is accidental gunshot deaths of children are at the lowest point in history? We've never seen a lower number. 
the actual number is fewer than 100 a year now. And I'm well, looking at that and going, well, this is, you know, this is a result of education. One of, one this is the, huge. Well, I think one of the big reasons why, and we work very closely with emergency rooms physicians as well, is that deaths are at an all-time low. But a lot of that has to do with increases and improvements in life-saving medical technologies as well. We're still at a point where this happens to eight kids a day. And I think eight kids a day is too many. I think one kid a day getting shot by a very, very avoidable eight, tragedy. Eight, wait, wait, are you many, saying so that? Wait, are you saying that eight? Ki- are you saying that eight kids a day are being shot accidentally? Yes. According to whom? Yes, and that's that's uh, CDC data, and that comes from data from hospitals. No, no. Where the, yes, I'm I've, sorry. I've I'm sorry. No, it's, not, it's, your... it's, it's Yeah, no, no. I, I I see the data. That's what I do for 50 years. I look at this data. What they're what you're doing is including the numbers up to 21 or even 23 years old. No, that's not children. No, we are not. That is that is 17 and under. 17 is not a child. I, I'm sorry, it's not. They're they're considered a they're they are considered they may a, be minor. a minor, but they are, they're not a they child. They are not able to. They are no. not able to purchase a gun on their that, own. And this is anybody who's not able to purchase their own gun. I'm sorry. And they gang, are, gang bangers, you know, at 16, 15, shooting each other, that does not qualify. You're, you're being disingenuous that, this here. This isn't either. That's, that's not, these, aren't, these, aren't, these aren't including attempted homicides data. These are uh, guns right, let, found in the uh, home. All right. Let me switch over. Uh, where's Brady on uh, banning so-called the focus group tested term, weapons of war. Yeah, we support restrictions on weapons of war and high capacity magazines, because I'll say as someone who has used them in combat, especially with the high capacity magazines, there isn't a a need for them. And I think Dayton really showed that, the fact that police had taken out this individual in 30 seconds, and he was still able to kill nine people because of the high capacity magazine that he had. And if these are things that you want to be being able to shoot at ranges and uh, you know have have fun with, maybe that's something we should talk about. But there's no need for a civilian walking down the street to be able to walk into any any store and purchase something like this. Well, let's see now. I am. It was more than 50 years ago. I used a semi-automatic rifle to shoot my first deer. It was a 308 762 by 51 in your parlance. So we've been using semi-automatic rifles for hunting for far longer than that. And, of course, most people don't shoot anybody. We have 16 to 20 million AR-15s. And, of course, you being a combat veteran, you know that the AR-15 is not an M4, not even close to an M4. It's not fully automatic. It's not select fire. It works the same way as President Teddy Roosevelt's rifles did 100 years ago. Well, and that's that's why the the focus is on things like large capacity magazines. I know when you shot that deer, you didn't need a hundred rounds to do it, did you? But but you know what? That gun will take a capacity, uh, a bigger capacity magazine. It's not the capacity of the magazine, and it's not the type of gun. It's the twisted, strange yeah. person out there who's doing something. And here's the thing: ninety nine point nine percent of people who have these guns or have the magazines don't shoot people. So you're you're saying. All you people who are not doing anything wrong, you got to give that up so that we can address something that we don't actually have the courage to deal with, which is the mental illness and the twisted things that are going on here. And we look at this and say, well, why are you targeting it, me? It, it, why, why me? Why are you targeting me and my guns? And I've done nothing. It's a yes. It's a yes. And is our conversation. We absolutely need to discuss mental health issues that we have in, in this country. We but need you still to want to ban guns. Incentivizing. And you still want to ban guns. Certain people. Because there's not there 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 are you can you can go out and shoot a deer with three rounds. I do it quite a bit. You know what? The you don't Second Amendment is, rounds to do it. The Second Amendment has nothing to do with deer hunting. It is all about individual rights to own guns that are in common well, use according to the Supreme Court. And these guns are in common that, use. So how does that gel very, with the Second Amendment? I say that's a very, very new interpretation of the Second Amendment it, that what? only came wait, wait, into wait. place after Heller. Like no, Heller was the first that's time not, there was that's actually not true. Rights. I'm sorry, that's and not true. Very much you around go, the collective right. No, the collective right was never supported by the Second Amendment, all the way back to the Miller decision. Never was the Second Amendment ever su- uh, supported as a collective right by the Supreme Court, ever in its history. The, the Heller, Heller was the first decision, and even Scalia, in his decision on Heller, said it was not absolute. 
that no, it does not right. cover every single type of, of weapon. And so that means there are times that as a populace that is evolving, a populace that is in a changing demographics where we're becoming more dense, more populous, reasonable people should be able to come together and say, what are all of the multifaceted, comprehensive things we can do to actually address this epidemic? We well, Kyle, yes, look, I, I'm, I'm out of time. In, in I've actually health. run longer than we normally do. I appreciate you. I appreciate your service. I did want to establish that the Brady Group still is a gun ban group. You're calling for gun bans, of course. And I, I appreciate it. Look, you're welcome back here anytime, but we do have the time limits, and I, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right, 866-TALK-GUN. Be right back with more gun talk. Why do hunters and shooters love the Ruger American Rifle? With right-handed and left-handed versions, all-weather, Magnum, Compact, Predator, Ranch, and Scope package options, there's a Ruger American for everyone. Lightweight with an adjustable trigger and minute of angle accuracy, Ruger American Rifles pack in the features. Is the Ruger American the best rifle on the market? See for yourself at your local retailer or at Ruger.com. That's Ruger.com. Tired of searching the web for the best deals on guns, ammunition, and gear? Download the free Gun Dealio app today for deals and discounts right at your fingertips. Handguns, rifles, shotguns, ammo, optics, lasers, gun safes, targets, gun cleaners, grips, slings, and much, much more. Save money on products you want from the companies you love. New deals, discounts, and rebates added daily. Gun Dealio, available for free in the App Store and Google Play. Perhaps more than any other landscape, wetlands embody the life-giving abundance that nature has to offer. And perhaps more than any other organization, Ducks Unlimited is working to ensure that our continent's wetlands not only survive, but thrive for generations well beyond this one. The time is now to band together. The time is now to rescue our wetlands. FN, the world's most battle-proven firearms. You want to reach for history, for greatness. So reach for the FN 5.7, a 5.7 millimeter pistol built with the DNA of over a century of legendary FN firearms. And now, it's within reach at your local firearms dealer. The FN 5.7 is the perfect combination of accuracy and stopping power. FN, the world's most battle-proven firearms. I appreciate the Brady group. I guess they're just called Brady now. It used to be the Brady campaign for that Handgun Control Incorporated before that coalition to ban handguns. And, you know, I appreciate the fact that uh, Kylie Ann is a Marine Corps veteran. It doesn't mean she knows much about guns. I've seen her on YouTube talking about how AR-15s, you know, are not, not any good for home defense because they just shoot through all those walls. I'm going, really? I've shot through a lot of walls with AR-15s. I can get them to go through the first wall. I cannot get them to go through a second wall. I don't care if you're using full metal jacket or what you're using. Can't. Buckshot will go through a lot of walls. Handgun bullets will go through a lot of walls. But 5.56, five, no, haven't been able to make that happen. We actually built walls and went out and tested them for the TV show. Shot through them with a bunch of different stuff. Um... It's interesting. I mean, and I do appreciate them. One of the things I think is going on, because people have said, well, why would they want to be on gun talk? I think Brady got passed up. I think they are searching for a way to become or regain some sort of relevance. Bloomberg money has blown everybody else out of the water on the gun ban side of things. I did love it when she said, well, we're not, you know, we don't call for the banning of handguns anymore. No, just the banning of rifles. <laughs> this is better? How? Oh, my gosh. And then, you know, home invasions are on the rise. Typically, it's two-plus people breaking into your home. 
I've seen a lot of reports of two, three, four, five. I got, I got one report with video. 13 people. 13 people doing home invasion. Here's a question for you. What gun would you recommend someone use? There's a, a woman is in her home, and there are five big dudes kicking in the door. Should she have a 38 revolver? Should she have a 9mm handgun? Or should she not have the option to have the tool necessary? I don't know. It's just, you know, and we were time limited, and I appreciate her uh, tone. It was, you know, not argumentative, and I tried not to be other than you have to ask some questions. You know, you just, you have to ask the questions. It's been an interesting week. Obviously, we had uh, Dayton, had El Paso. There's something weird going on, and I, you know, if you've listened to this show for any length of time, I am not a conspiracy theorist, but there's something weird going on here. Christchurch shooting in New Zealand. The fellow said the reason he was killing all those people is so that he could push the gun control agenda and get more gun control passed in New Zealand and in the United States. Killing people to promote gun control. He was right. It happened. Dayton Shooter, I think, was kind of along those same lines. Very leftist. A supporter of Elizabeth Warren. Not that she's responsible. Not saying that. Steve Scalise, who was shot by a fellow who wanted to kill Republican lawmakers. Super leftist, Bernie Sanders employee, worker, volunteer maybe, um, wanted to kill Republicans. I'm just not seeing that on the other side. There's this thing called projection where people say, well, you know, I just don't think I trust myself. Well, you know what? That's a problem that you have. That's your own impulse control issue, but it doesn't apply to us. Just because you are not trustworthy doesn't mean that we are not trustworthy. Our number is 866-TALK-GUN if you'd like to join us here. I'm Tom Gresham. This is Gun Talk. Check it out, guntalk.com and shopguntalk.com. Good morning, Mr. Gresham. Your mission, should you decide to accept it, is to host a radio show that will bring truth and common sense to the discussion of firearms rights in this country. Good luck, Tom, to you and your Tom Gresham's Gun Talk team. All right, welcome back. 866-TALK-GUN, or just call me at Tom Talk Gun. Open lines if you would like to chat. If there's a range report you'd like to share, something you've been out shooting, something you've been buying or getting ready for hunting season, let me know what you've been doing. 866 Talk Gun. Way up in uh, Montana, they got a, well, they got a Senate race everywhere. It seems like at least a third of the place, places do. <laughs> so a third of the seats. Uh, they got a Senate race going. And uh, Jack Ballard decided he was going to jump into the middle of it. He joins us right now. A Democrat. Hey, hello, Jack. Hey, Tom. So, all right, give me the the elevator pitch. People who don't know you and why someone should support you for the U.S. Senate. Well, Tom, I'm a native Montanan, a lifelong hunter, angler. For the last uh, about 15 years, I've made my living as a, a an outdoor writer, writing primarily in the areas of big game hunting, fly fishing. Uh, and also a lot in relation to uh, wildlife habitat and conservation. And what I'm seeing in Montana is uh, in, increasingly we're doing a, a really poor job of managing our public lands for uh, wildlife habitat. Uh, access uh, to public lands is becoming problematic. And the whole area of conservation and public lands is one of the centerpieces of my platform. And, and that was really kind of a primary motivator for me to get into the race. Okay. I mean, and I don't disagree with you on any of that. Access is, is a big deal. If you can't get to it, you can't use it. And public lands are meant to be used. That's you know, the old original definition of conservation is wise use. It's not as opposed to preservation, which is don't use. So I'm glad to hear you say that. So if you're an outdoor writer, that means you're starving to death, right? <laughs> well, 
we we uh, my 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 wife does uh, similar work to mine, and uh, we like to tell people we have an interesting lifestyle and a modest paycheck. I understand. Look, I grew up son of an outdoor writer. I have been an outdoor writer for most of my life in some form or fashion. Get it. I've edited a lot of the outdoor magazines, so I, I understand. I'm just having a little fun with you. All right, let me ask you a question here. Uh, you're running as a Democrat, and I guess the our first question is why, and then on the firearm side of things, the Democrat Party has been very much anti-gun, at least on its leadership side. So how do you reconcile all that? Well, I, I think, Tom, it's important to remember that the Democratic Party, just like the Republican Party, is not a, a singular entity. Uh, and so I think you really need to remember that there's a big difference between what I would call a Western Democrat and a, a coastal Democrat. Mm -hmm. um, and so in, in Montana, uh, we have uh, Democrats uh, in leadership. Uh, John Tester, our senior senator in the U.S. Senate, is a Democrat. Uh, Steve Bullock, our current governor, uh, is a Democrat. Uh, why did I choose this party? I think in relation to a lot of issues, I identify more strongly with the Democratic Party, obviously. Um, when I was a kid growing up on a ranch in western Montana, you know, this is like uh, late 1960s, 1970s, you know, my family and most rural folks and my two uncles who were minors in Butte, um, those people voted Democrat. Uh, the Democratic Party was considered the party of labor, the party of rural Montana. Oh, oh I, and, I understand. I mean, I, I get and, and, where, and, where it and, came and, from, but that's not who it is now. So, I mean, it's it's a, in my view, it's a very different party. It's it's a party of the coasts. It is a party of uh, basically anti-growth, and it's most definitely a party of trying to take guns away. I mean, a big part of the Democrat Party platform is to ban certain rifles. So, I mean, I, I personally have a problem with that. I'm just wondering, you're in a state where you got a lot of gun owners. How do you convince Montana gun owners who, I want to be a part of the Democrat Party, send me up there, and I'm going to go, you are going to go tell them to pound sand every time they want to pass another gun control law? Well, I don't think, Tom, of... Uh... That, that that it's quite that simple. Um, I'm I'm hearing in in relation to gun laws, uh, mm -hmm. and this is definitely filtered through the uh, lens of mass shootings. Uh, I'm I'm hearing from gun owners in Montana. These are primarily people uh, like myself, like my family, who used guns primarily for hunting, and I guess secondarily. Uh, for personal protection, I'm hearing from those people, we we need to have a conversation. Um, are we in the right place in relation to gun ownership? Well, um, what does it mean? When you say it, we need to have a conversation, what does that mean? Because you know, we've been having this conversation for at least 50 years, and all I'm hearing from uh -oh. the Democrats is we want to take your guns away. Uh, okay, Tom. Uh, two, two places where the conversation is coming to me right now. In relation to gun, in, in from gun owners in Montana, okay. one has to do with background checks, mm -hmm. and the other has to do with firearm capacity. Okay. Uh, you know, it's silly to talk about. Uh, I get real frustrated when people talk about banning, you know, an assault rifle. Well, an assault rifle just happens to be. You know, in the minds of some people, this scary-looking military-style rifle. Mm -hmm. But until you attach a clip to it, it has no more uh, capacity than a semi-automatic hunting rifle that's clip-fed. And so you have to be really sensible about the way you frame this and factual. But the two things that I'm hearing from gun owners in Montana are, you know, if that gun is worth having for 
commercial transactions, they're worth having for private sales. And well, let me ask you a question. I'm, I'm just you know because I, I am going to be short on time here, so I got to ask some questions here. Sure. So the, this, this expanded background check, uh, what that means is that if my neighbor lady, uh, her boyfriend has just beat the snot out of her, and she's not going to be able to go down and buy a gun until Monday, I can't loan her a handgun on Saturday. That would be a crime. That's what you're supporting? I, I'm talking about the sale. I'm talking about the sale. But, the, but that's not, that's not how it works. But I, I'm sorry, Jack, that's not how it works in the states that have... This expanded background check, you can't even loan a gun to someone. That is a crime. You can't you can't loan a gun to your buddy to go pheasant hunting. You couldn't loan a gun to this woman to protect her life for a weekend. That's a crime. That's what the universal background check is. Uh, okay. So so the question though, Tom, in in that instance, is the mm-hmm. best way for you to protect that woman is the best way to protect her is loaning her a firearm and leaving her on her own to potentially face, uh, you know, a boyfriend who might also be it may be It that. may not be the best way, but you're telling me I should be legally prohibited from doing that, and she should be charged with a crime if she borrows the gun from me, because that's what a universal background check is. I'm talking about universal background checks in relation to sales of firearms. But, okay. but you're, you're in a fantasy Walmart, world. I'm sorry. You need to find out what it is. You're actually just, you say universal background check, and then in the next breath, you tell me you don't know what it means. And I'm telling you, I when it is put it means, into these. Tom, Tom, no, you know what you want it to mean. In my mouth, I told you specifically in relation to sales. And that's okay. not how the law is written, Jack. What I support is background checks without exception in relation to the sale of firearms. Okay. Well, uh, and I, that's what I'm telling you. If you will go and look at how universal background check laws are written and how they are implemented in a number of states where they exist now, you will find that they always apply to loaning a gun to someone. You can't loan it to your buddy. And now we're go- both going to have to go to a gun store to do this sale, if you want to do a sale, let's just go with your idea of a sale. And then if he wants to, you know, bring it back to me, then it's a god-awful mess. And here's the other part. Murders are down by half. Gun crime is down by 70% over the last 20 years, according to the FBI. And here you are talking about limiting magazine capacity and universal background checks. I'm just not seeing the value of it. And I understand there's this feeling that we have to do something, but let's not do the wrong thing. Let's not do things that have already been tried and failed because the universal well, background check uh, has been tried uh, and uh, failed in, and, and magazine limits okay. has been tried and failed. In, in, in relation to magazine capacity, mm-hmm. what I'm hearing from people is in, you know, we have a series of mass shootings, highly publicized mass shootings. Yeah, about two, about, two, about two dozen a year. And, and in relation to that, what I'm hearing from people is if, if we reduced magazine capacity and that reduced the body count in those mass shootings, is that not worth doing? Okay, what, what would be the and right in number? Relation and, what, uh, what's the right number for a magazine? What's the right number? Yeah, you, you got to have a number. How, how many rounds should a magazine hold? Uh, okay, I'll tell you this. In relation to legitimate purposes for using a firearm, recreational shooting, hunting, personal defense, if you can't get it done in 10, you ain't going to get it done in 30. Okay, will you also apply that to police? To police? Yes. Uh, Okay, police are in a little bit different situation. It was about five five weeks ago that the guy in Dallas uh, went to the... I believe it was a courthouse uh, with the intention, it appeared, of a mass shooting. The photos that came from that were disturbing. Here's a guy. Well, I would hope so. And they had a platform with 30 round magazines. He's confronted by law enforcement officers with, with, with sidearms. Okay? 
Hey, uh, Jack, I gotta get, uh, Jack can, right I, can I get you to hold a second? I'm not cutting you off. I just need to hold. i got to run to a commercial break. If you'll hold, we'll come back. We'll pick up the conversation. We're talking with Jack Ballard. He's a uh, candidate for the U.S. Senate from Montana. I've got to take this break. I apologize. 866-TALK-GUN. When the U.S. military's elite units and law enforcement agencies across the globe demanded innovation and reliability, they didn't settle. They chose Sig Sauer. When world champion professional shooters demanded precision accuracy, they didn't settle. They chose Sig Sauer. So it's no surprise more and more civilian gun owners are refusing to settle for anything less. They're choosing Sig Sauer firearms, ammunition, electro-optics, suppressors, air guns, and training. Sig Sauer. Never settle. Attacks happen every day. How will you react? See real people put into real-life criminal attack situations on First Person Defender. Discover what works and what doesn't. Kidnapping, ATM robbery, home invasion, and other attacks. Learn how to save your life and the lives of your family. Get the entire first season on DVD at ShopGunTalk.com. Get prepared. ShopGunTalk.com. It's the Bill of Rights, not the Bill of Needs. I'm Alan Gottlieb, founder of the Second Amendment Foundation. When someone says we don't need that kind of gun, remind them the Founding Fathers determined what rights our Constitution should protect. There's a world of difference between rights and needs. It is not the function of government to tell us what we need or what we don't. Certainly no one needs an assault rifle or a Saturday Night Special, or for that matter, no one needs a Corvette with a high-capacity horsepower engine capable of speeds to 150 miles per hour. But in the hands of honest, responsible individuals, we have the right of choice. We have the right to read books others don't like. We have the right to listen to any radio program we choose. We have the right to dress the way we want to. We also have the right to own firearms of our choice. So the next time someone tells you, you don't need something, tell them. It's the Bill of Rights, not the Bill of Needs. Join the Second Amendment Foundation today so that this message and our Bill of Rights might live. Call 425-454-7012. That's 425-454-7012. Tactical professionals who put their lives on the line every day depend on Surefire. Since 1979, Surefire has designed, machined, and assembled the finest flashlights and weapon-mounted lights right here in the U.S. From everyday carry flashlights with 1,200 lumens and mil-spec hard anodized finishes to the most reliable weapon lights on the market for duty use or your home defense firearm, Surefire has what you need. American-built, American-strong. Visit Surefire.com. All right, we're back with you. We're talking with Jack Ballard. He is a candidate for the U.S. Senate from Montana. Jack, I appreciate you staying with us. Um, when you said that the police have a different situation, so they should have more ammo, I'm just thinking, you know, they've got body armor. They've got a radio to call for backup. i got none of that. What am I supposed to do? What, what if it takes my daughter or your daughter 11 rounds instead of 10 and she doesn't have enough? Uh, again, Tom, I would say... If you can't get it done in 10, I don't think you're going to get it done in 11. Well, I'm uh, sorry, but I, you know, and, I'm just going to say this. You have not been then, you, you've not been trained. You have not been to the schools that I've been to. You've not worked with. I work with Secret Service, uh, with CIA, with Delta Force, with SEALs, and none of them for civilians say you should be restricted in the number of rounds it takes because they don't know what it's going to take. I, again, I apologize for the short amount of time. We're just we're, we're hamstrung here. Jack Ballard is a candidate for the U.S. Senate Democrat from Montana. Thank you. I appreciate your time, sir. I wish you all the luck in the world. Uh, you know, if it's me, you know, I think Supreme Court injustices and more Democrats means more liberals on the courts. It really, for me, comes down to that. interesting. We had uh, the Brady campaign people advocating gun bans, and then we have the candidate in Montana, Jack Ballard, Democrat, running for the U.S. Senate, advocating banning standard capacity magazines with the idea that if you can't get it done in 10, you're just not going to get it done. Well, does that mean if I can't get it done in 10, I deserve to die? What does that mean, really? 
can't get it done in 10. Focus group tested. Well, as Jim says, uh, you know, there's a reason he's running as a Democrat, because he supports gun control. He wants to end the private sale of guns, and he doesn't even know what it means. That was the weird part. I mean, I kept going. He said, well, that's not what I mean. I said, well, but that's what the law says. That's what it is. You can say it shouldn't do that, but when you support it, that's what it does. It ends the private sale. You can't even loan a gun to somebody. <sighs> and, of course, I mean, there is the, the issue that if it really is all about judges and justices, and I believe it is, for long term, honestly, and, and look, I would, I would like to be able to say, gee, I would love to be able to vote for the person based on that person. Unfortunately, these days, there may have been a time when that was okay. But with the way that the leadership of the Democrat Party has its thumb on all of its members, both the House and Senate, they will vote along with the party. They will or they will suffer the consequences. He will vote for every gun control measure that Chuck Schumer tells him to vote for or else. The only way around that, I don't like this, but you know what? Not liking something is not the same as it not being true. You have to face up the way things are. The only way to fight this is to simply say, I will not vote for a Democrat. Not at the city council level not at the county commission level, not for school board, because wh where do you think they come from? Where do you think your state politicians come from? Where do you think your elected federal politicians come from? They come from those lower levels. Not voting for a D anywhere, just not. If you're a Democrat and you really do support gun rights, switch parties, which is not to say, for those who go, oh, but Tom, yeah, I know. It's not to say that I completely trust the Republicans. It's just the, the lesser of two evils in this case. So, I mean, that's kind of where we are. I did a really interesting interview on a network I'd never heard of, uh, I-24. They had me on with two other people. One was a, a former lieutenant from the Patterson, New Jersey Police Department. And this police officer, when asked, he said, well, yeah, I, I think that uh, probably private citizens shouldn't own guns at all. Only, only the police. Really? I mean, even the, the host of the show was going, really? What do you think about that, Tom? And I, I went through my drill and ended up and said, you know, uh, that's absurd. The idea that he would say only the police should have guns. What he needs to understand is I actually heard the government in federal court argue that, well, only, they said, well, do you think that only people in the National Guard should have guns? He said, the lawyer for the government said, this is way back in Clinton days, says, well, only when you're officially working for the Guard, but you couldn't own a gun privately. You have no right to own a gun privately, even if you're in the National Guard. He needs to understand that that would mean you, as a police officer, would mean you couldn't own a gun. You couldn't have a gun. You would have to leave your gun at the station and never have one with you anywhere. I'm sorry, that's just idiotic. A firearm for self-defense is a parachute. It's there to save your life. It needs to be available when you need it. It needs to work immediately when you need it. It's a powerful tool, and you need to master it. Hey, when we come back, let's talk about getting ready for hunting season. We're actually going to have some tips that are going to make you a better shot as you listen. Listen. 